Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you, Veronica? John? I'm doing just fine. Doing something I had no business. <laughs> it's called drinking a cup of coffee after 12. That's okay. I just ate a bowl of chocolate ice cream. So, oh, I know. <clears throat> I don't know. The ice cream not going to keep you awake at night. No, but it's probably going to put me to sleep. <laughs> and I have work to do. Gotcha. I'm sorry about not having a face-to-face -face, because I know some students really do like face-to-face -face, uh, lectures. Um, I like face-to-face because -face I'm kind of an interactive person where I tend to walk around. The Zoom has been killing me for the last two years because that means I have to stay seated. And I'm not so excited about that. I think I pace because it helps me think and it helps me write my lecture to flow because I'm accustomed to moving when I talk and my hands are all over everywhere and sitting behind this desk is just interesting. That's all I can say. But uh, we're going to uh, get started and thank you Ms. Dickerson for taking a roll for me. And I'm so excited to see so many of you sitting here with the fact I know you have a test tomorrow, so best wishes and prayers toward you all being successful on your test. And um, let's see, let me share. Looking forward to seeing you all the next lecture I have to do. I'm sure we won't be without electricity at that time. Ms. G, do you know like what is like the EPA for that by any chance? <laughs> what, what did you ask? What's your name? Car Karina. The EPA. Hey, Karina. ETA? I'm sorry, it's like estimated time. It's just because I'm like, we would have a test tomorrow and I know that it's now happened yesterday and that's today. Right. Well, the reason I asked permission to do it this way is because it was just too close to you all getting to lecture. You're telling me that you're going to be up at 12. The lecture starts at 12.30. So I asked permission. I didn't do it on my own. I asked permission if you all can have a Zoom today because some of you live kind of a distance. And if they threw it at us again at 11 o'clock saying, oh, the school is going to be closed till 3. Now you paid the babysitter and you drove in the city for nothing. So that's the reason why I kind of thought the Zoom would be better this time. Now, um, I guess they'll have to get in touch with you all in regards to like tomorrow because uh, right now the lights are on. We're just waiting for the internet. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm almost sure the internet should be on tomorrow. I mean, it's out of Intergy's hands now. It's in Delgado's hands uh, to get the internet back up and working, however they get it done. So, uh, you know, I'm sure there will be some insight tomorrow. Uh, if anybody, so far, I haven't heard anything because I'm going to Delgado with the, uh, with, you know, a group of students, and if you're one of those people in that group, so far I hadn't heard anything. So I'm going, I'll be at Delgado tomorrow at 8 o'clock, 8 30, to test out at 8 30. I usually try to get there a wee bit early. So looking forward to seeing whoever's going to be over there and looking forward to seeing you all um, next week. Thank you, Ms. Jane. Not a problem. Thank you for asking. All right. Um,
sometimes the sex okay and then there are the other times Okay. Recording in progress. See the little icon that allows me to know uh, that it's recording, but I did press record. I oh, see okay. it. It's okay. It's there. It's, it's recording. recording. Okay. Thank you so much. And remind me when I get off the ta on the tangent to uh, post, because sometimes I talk to people after, and I don't want all that on the recording. You know, that's kind of a quiet time there. So anyway, we're doing metabolism. We have metabolism one and metabolism two. We're doing the DKA and the HHS today. Um, I see being in a recording <laughs> on my face anyway. Uh, so let's just, oh, let's see. Let's see if I can get it running because sometimes it decides because I want to run, like right now. And I've done this lecture today because I know for a fact it, it's working. My internet's working, but you just never know. All right. So we're talking metabolism, DKA, uh, and HHS, which is hyperglycemic uh, hyperosmolar state. That's the last time I'm probably going to say that. And I will be, um, as the lecture progresses, I will be um, adding more insight to it because there are multiple names for the HHS. And there's a lot of thought behind it, but you're not interested in that because I'm not going to ask you about that. Now, here is a recommendation for review for diabetes knowledge. Actually, I think type one and type two is on here. However, um, that's simply uh, for review. You don't have to do that if you are well, if, if you happen to be well versed in diabetes knowledge. But a lot of times, I at least give you all some way to review because a lot of things I'm not necessarily going to cover. I'm not going to really cover a lot of the uh, medications and how they work and uh, what they do and what they don't do. So um, you've had that in pharmacology and you had um, diabetes mellitus and level two. So what I'm going to be talking about are major complications, life-threatening complications of diabetes mellitus. Um, and those two are the ones I just named, DKA and HHS. So it would be great if we could just um, study every um, concept alone, but there is no such thing as a concept all by itself. Everything is interrelated to some degree. We're talking about one individual. So that individual as a whole will have all of these properties going on in their lives. The oxygenation, the perfusion, the mobility, elimination, electrolytes, sensory, IC regulation, that's not up there. But I'll probably talk a little bit about it when I somewhat talk about the sensory. So this is where I get you all to help me a little bit so I can take a sip of coffee and I'm just eating. Um, so basically, diabetes, mellitus, hyperglycemia, uncontrolled, will cause complications to any organ that you have in your body. All right. So you want to always make sure um, that um, the hyperglycemia is under control. 
All right, can someone help me out to figure why perfusion is affected by diabetes mellitus hyperglycemia? Because the blood gets dysphysic, it gets thicker, if I'm not mistaken. That's, yes, you're not mistaken. That's correct. So the blood does get thicker. And what happens is your microvascular and your macrovascular. When I say microvascular, I'm talking about the capillary. When I say macro, uh, I'm talking about the renal, um, the uh, cerebral, those type of uh, vessels. So they get remodeled. And when they get remodeled and you have this viscous blood trying to throw, um, flow through these vessels, you're going to have a lot of difficulty. If you remember perfusion, blood brings oxygen and nutrients to the cells so that the cells can survive. The nutrients, if you think about it, is your glucose. So if your perfusion is poor, you can't get it there, then now you're not getting enough oxygen, O2 molecule, into the blood. So now you have some oxygenation problems because of the decreased uh, perfusion. So let's um, look at the fact when we talk about oxygenation, there is an issue of breathing, especially in DKA, that, uh, that has a name, specific name. Do you remember it? It's kind it of small. There you go. All right. I'm just trying to wake you up and let you know that you know, I remember some of this stuff that I learned at level two, even though this is level four, uh, I brought it with me. So when your cellular metabolism is really depressed because you can't get your oxygen and your nutrients, um, they're not getting to the cells, this is of course gonna lead to what they call cellular death. And you don't want to lose um, your cells. Kind of the same process with the renal system. Uh, the renal system can only handle so much. And uh, your perfusion to your renal area is going to cause the renals not to be able to even process some of the glucose. When it's way too much hyperglucose, then it's eventually just going to be throwing off fluid and leaving a lot of the glucose in the blood. Okay? Um, your electrolytes, especially potassium. Your potassium makes this major shift uh, when the patient is dehydrated. And they are dehydrated because this hyperglycemia is going to cause the renal system to actually make the uh, throw a copious amount of uh, fluid. So now we have a dehydrated person. Uh, and when they become dehydrated, things like um, your electrolytes, like you'll be in hyperglycemia, um, hyperkalemia and hypernatremia because you're now dehydrated. Uh, so think about it like that. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the potassium later on because you realize what's happening when they become dehydrated the potassium will be leaving the cells and going into the uh, vascular system. Okay. Now, another concern that we have is called cerebral edema. Uh, that's under your IC regulation. What's happening is uh, this occurs whenever your intracellular shift uh, happens. And this is especially in children and adolescents. So I won't be talking much about that. Um, as far as your sensory, if you um, if you remember your peripheral sensation, you remember you used to tell them, make sure that you check your feet every day and your legs every day, because they really don't have much feeling down there because of the uh, 
neuropathy type of, of episodes that they'll have. So um, we have to make sure that um, we teach our, stu our students, our patients, that they have to maintain all of this because of um, it can destroy your body, essentially. They can start losing limbs. We're looking at mobility. You don't want them to lose limbs, so you have to educate, educate, educate. Now, you notice I've got tissue integrity kind of in line with that. What will start happening sometimes is they will eventually have breakdown if they keep their glucose up really high. They would have tissue breakdown. Uh, they will also have um, like ulcers. Uh, you see the darkening of the legs. Uh, in some instances, unfortunately, necrosis will happen and they have to lose a limb, and God forbid to lose a limb is, is a loss. So then we really have to educate and deal with uh, these circumstances that can happen to the patient. The patient gets to the point where, okay, they're going to lose a limb. We're going to have to rigorously um, talk with them, explain to them what's going on, um, once the limb has been uh, removed, um, what are they going to go through? They're going to go through a healing process, and they're going to go through this grief and loss thing as well. And the reason they're going through grief and loss because they have lost a part of their body. And we got to be there for them for that. We need to tell them, you know, that yes, they will have a, um, what they call a stump. And um, as they rehab, at one time, at one point, they may be able to walk around again because um, they can get a prosthetic uh, limb to kind of help them about um, their life or their days. So when we look at nutrition and mobility, those two are keys to even helping people balance their glucose along with help preventing hyperglycemia. So before I move on to the next slide, are there any questions? Okay, thank you. Let's see if it's going to move. Yay. All right, let's look at um, BKA overview. All right. Yes, it's life threatening. Dr. Delima talked a little bit with you all about the metabolic acidosis in relation to DKA. Um, these are the characteristics of DKA. Um, they tend to have ketoacidosis and keto um, urea. This is more common in the younger population, uh, usually a type one diabetic, because there's absolutely no insulin production due to destruction of the uh, beta cell. So the patient will become totally insulin dependent, okay? So let's look at what's happening here. The more the body attempts to compensate in diabetes type 1, and in some instances, I'm going to show you where type 2 may get DKA. It's rare, but it happens. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we progress. Okay, so It's trying to compensate for that high glucose in the blood. So what's, if, if um, the insulin is inhibited or there is no insulin at all in this case, then what's going to happen is the cells are going to starve. And without nutrition, there is, you know, tissue death or cellular death. 
uh, fatty, uh, free fatty acids can convert to keto acid acids, which is a major problem with accumulation of ketones. That's where your ketones come from. And the DK has many ketones causing metabolic uh, imbalances, such as metabolic acidosis. Now, um, that's not the only, you have lactic acidosis. So you have a lot of the acids trying to compensate and break down to make glucose so that the cells could get fed. So it's a lot of um, compensations here. They're trying, um, your body's trying to compromise. All right. So we already talked about the respiratory complication because that's Kuzma's breathing. All right. This is why the patient experiences this. Now, it starts off, if you notice, this starts off with multiple acids, and it eventually works its way to osmotic diuresis. So when you have that osmotic diuresis, uh, now you're sending that patient into what we call dehydration. Uh, dehydration is uh, very important to treat because now you don't have the fluid, so something is going to start happening to the hemodynamic uh, parts of the body, like the blood pressure, the, uh, the uh, heart rate. So because a lot of the uh, fluid is leaving the intracellular space, and all of this is just trying to dilute that real viscous blood. The kidneys will remove the water, but it's unable to move excessive amount of uh, glucose and ketones, which will lead to severe dehydration. Okay. Any questions about that mouthful? Okay, we'll move on. So remember, they used to have, um, they have rapid weight loss in a newly diagnosed patient. Assessment. So we've got your dehydration, which we kind of talked about. Um, usually your dehydration, you can tell by kind of the the loss in fluid, kind of the sunken eyeballs, the poor skin turban, the change in uh, your hemodynamics, which leads to shock, and that is you will become what? As far as your heart and your blood pressure, your heart rate and your blood pressure, what do you expect when someone is going into shock? Come on, you all got this. Increased heart rate, um, alter mental status. Mm -hmm. There you go. Increased heart rate, altered mental status, and as it gets worse, decreased blood pressure. Okay? And it actually is uh, going to affect the organs. All right? So you're going to see some signs of organ failure especially like uh, the kidneys. All right. So hyperglycemia can play a major role. The blood is viscous. The person can become thirsty, frequent urination, um, infection. Infection can actually bring on DKA and a lot of the patients, especially Klebsiella pneumonia. All right, UTI can do it as well, but I think uh, Klebsiella pneumonia is like the leading cause according to the resource that I use. Um, we've already talked about metabolic acidosis a little bit. This is where you also have that Kuzma breathing and the keto breath. 
in. Um, I believe we've already talked about the shop. Now, this may not be all of the medications, but these are a few of the medications that will cause a diabetic type 2 to get the KA. All right? Corticosteroids is one of the main ones that we usually run into that will give you that elevated uh, glucose. So that's the one we are mostly involved in. Like the others, not so much. Um, as far as knowing what the drugs are for, not necessarily. You don't have to know that, but just remember, um, you know, the drugs that can potentially DKA in a type 2 diabetic. Uh, other reasons uh, diabetes mellitus type 2 will get DKA. It's one, they're not taking their insulin properly. Two, they're not taking their oral um, anti-diabetic uh, medicines properly or at all. And when they don't take them, there is um, it's a possibility to get DKA. But it's rare in type 2. So what does the medication corticosteroids do? It actually inhibits the work of insulin. So if they got a little bit insulin in their body, uh, the corticosteroids is not allowing the insulin to work. All right. Many on gap. I'm not going into a lot of details about any on gap, but when it's high, they're usually in metabolic acidosis. This is just a protocol that I thought that was reasonable if I should test on anything of this nature. Um, it's transitioning from IV insulin drip to subcutaneous. Each facility, what you will find, will have their own protocol. Uh, the facility I'm at, we have a protocol for hyperglycemia, a protocol for HHF, and a protocol for DKA. So once you start working, you know those particular protocols. Uh, as far as the formula for any on gas, I have not asked any questions about the formula, so don't waste a lot of time trying to calculate this particular one. I will be asking about calculation of metabolism, but that will be in metabolism too, not this one. All right. Your normal anion gap is 10 to 12. So usually if it's above 13, um, then the anion gap is considered high. Now where I get my lab values from, because we've been using multiple books to avoid saying anything else, the lab sheets that you all have is taken from the Ganda and the Ganda uh, laboratory books. So we have the critical care book and we have the other Pearson book. And one might say one thing and one might say the other. So that's the reason I decided to use what you have on your lab sheets as opposed to what you will have in the two different books. And that's kind of to help me to keep down confusion. All right. Any questions before I um, go to HHS? Okay. This complication has multiple names, and it's like a big history behind all these different names. So I chose to use the HHS because that's what it appears that the endocrine society decides they want to use. Because HHS 
patients are not always ketones free. Sometimes they will have ketones. So uh, it might be minimal. So uh, for instance, I think this is the one in your book, hyperglycemic, hyperosmolic, non-ketotic syndrome. Well, that's not always the case. Uh, sometimes they will have it. So that's the reason why they kind of uh, went with that particular name. Now what's happening here is uh, HHS is due to more of an insulin deficiency or a insulin resistance. Now where this problem com uh, comes from, it starts right at osmotic diuresis as opposed to the DKA, it worked its way there. It started with the acid, then eventually it had osmotic diuresis, where this particular one starts its cas cascade at osmotic diuresis, okay? And the patient kidney is not able to uh, concentrate the urine due to the glucosuria, which is what? Sugar in the uh, urine, glucose in the urine. Thereby, it removes much of the water. The kidneys usually remove glucose, but in some instances, it can. And especially when you have a comorbidity such as um, kidney disease. So um, just know that um, that HHS starts from osmotic diuresis. Now, I think I put these slides backwards, but it doesn't matter. It's not gonna make a big difference. I think one should have been before the other. These are some key points that I want you to see the difference between DKA and HHS. It's usually, DKA is usually associated with type one. However, I just showed you some situations where it can be with type two but it's mostly with type one. Your serum glucose is usually about 250, or greater than 250 actually. And your anion gap is usually greater than 13, and you're gonna have large ketones. Whereas the HHS, it's usually, it is associated with your type two. You notice your uh, serum glucose is a lot higher uh, with this particular patient. Uh, you notice there's, almost no ketone to very little. And HHS is kind of slow in uh, materializing. And because of this, it's sometimes nonspecific. And it may even uh, mimic some neurological condition that would lead to a delay in the treatment. So you always want to make sure you check that patient's glucose because this can be um, treated much earlier. So I'm sure most practitioners will at least check the glucose. This is the one I think I wanted to have in front, but that's okay. All right, the dehydration is the same as the um, DKA. The hyperglycemia is the same. Um, so is infection, but this one has led more to uh, example, it gave me an example like sepsis on a patient. So if your diabetic patient becomes septic in a critical care unit, if you happen to be doing your rotation or have done your rotation in ICU or um, you're gonna work critical care or whatever, um, sepsis will really cause an increase in that glucose. And of course, yeah, with the tachycardia would be the same. All right, as far as the medications that potentiate HHS, well, alcohol and cocaine is not a medication we need to order, but uh, that can cause a person to go into HHS, anesthesia, um, antiarrhythmics, your beta blockers, your corticosteroids, your diuretics, and I said et cetera, because it's a long list. 
and I don't need you to memorize a long list of medications that will potentiate HHS. And they too, what they do is uh, the serum, the serum um, glucose will elevate because the insula is uh, inhibited, so it can't do its job. And it may also even cause dehydration, like your diuretic. It's caused a dehydration, so it might cause a uh, potential HHS. Okay. I believe I have enough time before break to kind of run through this. Now, this is collaborative ma uh, management care priorities. All right. Um, let's just look at these briefly, and then I'll especially break down aggressive rehydration and the difference between DKA and HHS. So, one of the, the first thing you want to do is to resuscitate the patient in hemovolemic shock. And how you resuscitate them? You do what they call an aggressive rehydration. Aggressive rehydration. And that's what you want to um, do with this patient. Uh, you begin it uh, by replacing the fluids due to severe dehydration and in hemovolemic shock. So the fluids that you are going to use in this case will be, at the beginning, either half normal saline or normal saline. In your book, there is an area that's called um, corrective serum, uh, corrective serum sodium, I believe. I'm not asking you to do that, but that's how they'll determine whether they're going to use half normal saline in this situation or normal saline. Okay? Um, so they're going to use large copious amounts. The healthcare provider will make that decision from that calculation. And um, your book gives a protocol on how they decide how much they're going to have. But uh, I took this protocol from another critical care book where it at least kind of solidifies and you don't have to do the calculation of the weight and all that. So this is uh, the recommendation. So I will repeat this if necessary. I'm starting with DKA. Rehydration. DKA. The patient will receive one to two liters within that first 60 to 90 minutes of um, resuscitation. After which, they're going to get about four additional liters within a five hour period. Always make sure you reevaluate the patient. We're talking about DKA. Once the glucose falls below 300 milligrams per deciliter, then the fluid can be changed to B5 and a half on saline. And they usually give it at a high rate of Do I need to repeat that? Yes, please. Sure. With DKA, the first uh, hour to 90 minutes, you're going uh, hour to hour and a half, let's say it like this. You're going to give anywhere from one to two liters of normal saline or half normal saline. After which, you're going to also give an additional four liters within that first five hours. And then you're going to have to reevaluate. Once the glucose falls below 300 milligrams per deciliter, they may change it to uh, a solution of D5 and a half normal saline at a higher rate. Forgive me if I'm 
a lot of times don't repeat it the same way. That's the DKA. Now let's look at HHS. You remember I said HHS starts from osmotic diuresis? Well, these people can you lose from 100 to 200 uh, milliliters per kilogram of body weight. That's a lot of fluid to be lost. So these patients, the HHS, will get a lot more fluid. Within that first hour, they're going to get either half normal saline or normal saline for that first hour. Then the remaining eight liters should be given within a 24 hour period. So just to repeat, osmotic diuresis may cause the patient to lose from 100 to 200 uh, milliliters of fluid per kilogram of weight. And the first liter of either half normal saline or normal saline would be ran within that first hour. Then you have eight liters that should be given in a 24 hour period. Supporting the hemodynamics of both DKA and HHS. Now, hemodynamics pretty much treated the same way. If, you, if your blood pressure is dropping, you're going to give pressors. Um, control the, um, the tachycardia. So whatever medications that you need to address the hemodynamic issues, if, if they're big issues, then um, that's what you would do. Especially if the patient is there that has had an MI. All right? Now, what can happen with given so much fluid, so much copious, so much fluid, is that the patient can actually go into something called cardiogenic shock. And you don't want to send these hearts into a cardiogenic shock, especially if somebody had an MI, is having an MI. So it's imperative that you keep up with a strict INO, that you um, monitor the trend for the CVP, cerebral venous pressure, and the daily weight. That is a part of the protocol to just make sure that we don't fluid volume overload our patients because fluid volume overload can take them to a, a whole new um, problem. Okay. So let's look at control in the hyperglycemia. Now, I'm going to slow down on this because there are some numbers that I'm going to give you and I want you to make sure you understand them. What I will do is I will talk about DKA first, just to keep down confusion. But there is only one thing that's different in HHS and DKA. But I'll say each one of them as a DKA and then I'll go back and say with the HHS. Okay, <clears throat> so you give a bolus of regular insulin and they usually determine what that bolus is by using 0 0.1 unit per kilogram of body weight. And that's how they determine what they're going to give as a bolus. So give a bolus of regular insulin uh, by 0 0.1 unit per kilogram. I think your book says something slightly different, but this is what I'm going by. 
then they're going to order um because you're already kind of uh how you say rehydrating the patient so then they will order like um, insulin beer iv pump and at this point you can do what they call titration so when you titrate you want this done by increments of 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 unit per kilogram per hour. So you're going to titrate it by 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 unit per kilogram per hour. The glucose should not decrease any quicker than 50 to 70 milligrams per deciliter per hour. So they don't want the glucose to drop too quick. Now the target glucose is 140 to 180. So when the glucose decreases to 200, it's best to go toward according to the protocol that your facility is using. All right, so. Before I move to HHS, do you I'm need sorry. me to repeat? Can you repeat how, fa how uh, fast you don't want it to decrease by? Sure. The glucose should decrease by 50 to 70 milligrams per deciliter per hour. We don't want it to um, decrease any faster than that. Okay. We good? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right. So the HHS, you're not going to hear much difference. There's only going to be one area of difference. And I'll highlight that when we get there. All right. So you still, if you look at your notes from the beginning, if you see give a bolus of regular insulin, it's still that 0 0.1 unit per kilogram of body weight. That's how they determine your first bolus or your bolus then they're going to order a drip of insulin your titration is to be done by 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 units per kilogram per hour the glucose should be decreased by 50 to 70 milligrams per deciliter per hour. If, oh, I think I left it out, grass. Okay, if the glucose for HHS is less than 300 milligrams per deciliter, then decrease the insulin by 50%. If the glucose for HHS is less than 300 milligrams per deciliter, then decrease the insulin by 50%. The target glucose is 140 to 180. Once it is 200, once it decreases below 200, you can you look at the protocol to see if you're going to start feeding the patient and different things like that. Now, forgive me, I forgot a part of the DKA. So go back to the DKA and insert this, please. If the glucose for DKA is less than 200 milligrams per deciliter, then decrease the insulin by 50%. So if the glucose for DKA is less than 200 milligrams per deciliter, then decrease the insulin by 50 percent and really that was the only difference and i totally left it out because i usually read it as one sentence i usually go by one sentence and i noticed in the past that some of the students got confused with it now <clears throat> before you go through your insulin protocol 
You remember when they first came, they were hypernatremic and hyper by hyperneutrinic. Hypernatremic as well as hyperkalemic. So what you want to do because you've got copious amount of fluid, which once you rehydrate your patient and the potassium will actually flow back into the um, cells. So with the potassium flowing back into the cells, you no longer have that hyperkalemia. You don't know where you are. So before you give insulin, you really want to know what's your potassium level, because from what you've been taught, insulin will push potassium back into the cell. So if you're already low, and then I decide, okay, I'm going to give my insulin, I may make it even lower, leading to problems such as cardiac arrest, all right? So I just want to be mindful of that when it comes to the uh, potassium. I believe Dr. Delima kind of touched on that a little bit when she talked about acid base, all right? And the other thing is to measure the causes of hyperkalemia. Uh, when I say measure, uh, manage, like the patient that had sepsis, the patient that had pepsiella pneumonia, you're going to manage those, those issues because they're probably the reason they either had DKA or HHS, uh, hyperglycemic conditions. So um, you're going to manage that. And let's see if I want to go on. Okay, so what time is it? Perfect. Be back at um, 1.30 and we'll go over these case studies and the few questions I have and we'll be done. Thank you. Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. Okay, let's get started again. This is a case study um, that has several parts. So please uh, write any notes that you think you might need from this. This is pre-hospital. I did not say how fast the normal saline was running because I do not know how fast it runs in pre-hospital. All right, let's go to the next one. And when I didn't want it to, it constantly Moved to the next one. So let's see. All right. So I'm going to leave it there for a little while. So we have notes from the previous one. And I'll leave this here. So read through it carefully, please. Okay, so I'm going to start uh, asking about some cues. Your cues are found from your assessment. So let's consider you as being that ER nurse doing your admissions assessment. So what assessment findings should you include in caring for this patient? I'm asking for help. Uh, the blood pressure, um, heart rate is elevated, that um, glucose is also a key factor. Yes, good. Anybody else want to help? Positive for ketones and potassium is high. Very good. Oh, I think somebody did say the mental status. You say the eight what? Okay, so we looked at the vital signs, the oxygen, the neurological changes. Anything else you want to include? pH is low. Right, you're looking at your ABGs. The MAC is out of range. Yes. So that's a hemodynamic problem, which you would probably use a vasopressor. So you all are picking up great cues uh, that's important in this situation. I don't know why I said he was found down um, outside of the temperature. They have a fever and an O2 set. Right, and you have a poor O2 set. But looks like we already at least tried to address that, right? We intubated the patient. The patient is on a ventilator. Okay, so 
We all did excellent picking up these cues. What do you suspect this patient, which complication out of the home? Um, the exemplars we're referring to, which one do you think it might be? DKA. DKA, right. Because you got the fruitiness, you got the Cosmo. So more than likely it's DKA that you're dealing with. All right, let's look at your interventions. Um, what are some immediate interventions? Uh, some fluids because that blood pressure is too low, and then they're gonna maybe focus on um, getting something for that insulin, uh, glucose, the bolus mm -hmm. of insulin, and then the insulin drip. Okay. All right. So let's 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 look at that a little bit. So, and when I show it to you, it's not really in uh, the right order at this time. So. You're right, you wanna continue to rehydrate this patient with either half normal saline or normal saline. Because you remember with DKA, you got up to about, you got the first one to two liters in the first uh, 60 to 90 minutes. Then you have approximately four more liters that this patient is going to get. So that's going to help with the blood pressure. And it's all it's rehydrating the patient. So with rehydrating that patient, uh, you probably want to repeat that potassium because right now it's at 5.8. But it just depends. I didn't say which hour we were on. So it just depends. The potassium may very well have decreased because we are given so much fluid. So if that potassium has decreased, what we need to do is get a, a potassium run going. If they had a central line, you usually get 20 milliequivs, um, you know, over an hour. Every time you give it, you give it over an hour. Um, and it's whatever the protocol is at your facility. So you're going to... Uh, Repeat that potassium, and if necessary, you're going to do those potassium runs before you start that insulin. Because you remember I said that insulin takes it back, uh, takes potassium back into the cell. So you don't want your patient to become even more hypokalemic than they may already be. So you've got to kind of watch that. And of course, we intubated this patient, right? So with us intubating this patient, and I had these really awful um, ABGs prior to intubation, I probably want to repeat my ABGs post-intubation to see where we are as far as the electrolytes. You all did great. All right. I'm still not sure why I put found ill at home. There was a thought behind that. I remember him being in. Oh. Um, Isn't it because like when they get like that, they get very confused, hyperdiaphoretic, and um, they present like very behavior very uh, out of norm. They hallucinate. I've seen them hallucinate. Maybe that's why. Yeah, it's probably something like that. In being an old brain, some days he kind of pleaded. But when I look at it again, it's going to tell me what it is that I wanted to point out that this patient was found home ill. I hadn't built in anything about the insurance or anything at this time. I just wanted to really focus more on the immediate intervention. But well, good job. Appreciate you. All right. So, any questions with that particular case study? Ms. Jean, I just have one. At what yeah. low point of potassium should be should a care rider be initiated? 
Well, the norm is usually 3.5 to 5. I know they say when a patient's potassium is 2.8, they're ready for a cardiac arrest waiting to happen. So I would say like below 3.5 would be a safe assumption. It'll be lower than 3.5 for sure. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you for bringing up the question. All right. Here is case study number two. I only have two of them and I think I have about four questions. One of my questions, I think uh, I have to know it because it's something that I believe I left out and I'll look at it when I get to it. Um, so, Let's look at this case study. Okay, and another part of it is, these are the ABGs. If you notice, they're not quite as um, acidotic as it would be in BKA. So this one is HHS. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the main slide. Hold on. So, here are the questions that I'm asked for this one. What information that you might find important? Oh to kind of cue you in on this patient. That this patient may have um, HHS. That glucose? Oh yeah, the glucose for sure. What else? Looks like there's possibly an infection. Yes, definitely. There is some, high. Yes. So yeah, so we're looking the fact that there is an infection. That was one of the examples I think I use sepsis, but infection is uh, a possible cause for somebody to go to HHS. This is a type two diabetic, right? And the severe muscle pains can be from anything. Uh, it's not as rapid. Is not um, moving as rapidly as BKA. Right. Okay. All right. And if you look at the physical assessment abnormalities, the patient is confused. Got weak thready pulse, brown mucosa. We sounded like dehydration, huh? All right. So you all cover a lot of them. This patient probably has some respiratory infection. I think somebody did say it. It could be anything from the flu to anything else. All right. What is the immediate concern after obtaining the lab values? This patient exhibits signs and symptoms of dehydration. So I wrote a nursing diagnosis for this one. What do you think I wrote? Sepsis. 
because they're dehydrated. Electrolyte imbalance, fluid depletion. That's, oh, yes. I didn't write both of them, but what I did write is fluid volume deficit related to hyperglycemic induced dehydration and osmotic diuresis. This glucose is like 700 milligrams, which increased the cause of um, osmotic um, diuresis. So very good. Awesome. So let's um, analyze this patient. So I think we've already done that. So I'm just going to review what I said because you have already answered all of this. The patient has a history of diabetes mellitus type 2. Infection is known to exacerbate increased glucose. Uh, the patient has increased WBCs of 15,000 and has a fever. The muscle pain may be attributed to dehydration due to decreased blood flow. Or the muscle pain may also be associated with respiratory infection, like a flu. So um, you all did quite well with that. So we're just going to run through the prioritization of care. And basically, it's kind of the same order. Resuscitate the patient and hemovolemic shock of dehydration, which is aggressive rehydration. And I gave you uh, how do you aggressively do both of them. Hemodynamic support, given so much fluid, will probably bring the blood pressures up. Uh, and if that's not enough, more than likely, uh, they will give them pressure. You want to also, because you're already trying to control the hyperglycemia by rehydrating the patient. However, it's going to take insulin to really uh, bring it back for norm. But before you do that, you want to make sure your potassium is okay and all the potassium has not run, uh, gone back into the cells. So when you give the insulin, you're not pushing the last little bit back in, avoiding cardiac arrest. And of course, you're going to treat whatever that problem is that's causing a hyperglycemia. In this situation, it's an infection. All right? So that's the end of those, that um, case study. Do you have any questions from it? Okay, so let's see. We answered the questions. All right. So, fluid volume deficit, altered electrolyte imbalance. We talked about that. The only one on here we didn't talk about was acid base imbalance and altered acid base. The only thing I'm going to say is because I think they're. Uh, Bicarb was 20. And usually when it's under 20, it's replaced with bicarb, uh, sodium bicarb. So you want to make sure you keep an accurate strict INO. If there's a way, do your uh, central venous pressure, monitor that, and daily weights. And that's going to help you to keep your patient out of um, serious problems with uh, overhydration. Because you're from fluid volume deficit till you can go to fluid volume overload. So you want to be careful of that. Okay. We're in a home stretch. Just hang in there with me. All right. I want you to look at the question, answer the question to the best of your ability. Okay. My answer would be B, and I'll tell you why. 
Because if a patient is not sitting up properly, when you put the oxygen on, it's not going to help. If the patient is kind of slumped down in the bed, oh, they can't completely inhale and exhale. Just remember, when you take test questions that are saying first, that means all the answers are correct. But you really want to sit this patient up in a bed and provide oxygen. You can call a rapid response if this patient doesn't seem like they're getting any better or you can't pull that sat up out of the 85%. And of course, as always, you're going to notify the healthcare provider. But the best answer for first would be set the patient up in bed. So if you silently answer that, correct, great. Okay, let's look at this one. Let's read this one. Now, just know when you answer questions, the answer you may want might not be here. So you answer the question to the best of your ability of what you got to work with. Okay? I see a, a something in the chat. Uh, if that's a question, please verbalize it to me because sometimes I can't see it. I could just see I got one chat. Did someone have a question? Or they were answering the question. I said, open again because I couldn't hear you. Let me see if I could see it. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. You answered the question. I appreciate you. You even got it right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, in this particular question, I think the correct answer is D. Let's see. No, it won't move. It's getting tired of me all day. Okay. The reason being that just from what I told you, That these are characteristics of hyperglycemia. All right, they are consistent with DKA. A is incorrect because this does not uh, address the problem at this time. And B is incorrect because we're not showing signs of hypoglycemia. So you probably guessed that one. C is not a resolution to the problem. The patient must have more hydration than eight to 10 glasses of water, okay? The next question will be the sick days. Now, this table that I'm referring you to is actually in Karen. So, um, if you need a copy of it, if you can't find it uh, or you don't have the book, I probably can maybe take a picture and put it somewhere for you if necessary, but you gotta let me know. All right. So let's look at this and we're going to select all that applies. We're doing a teaching. So, would I teach them to check their glucose? Would I tell them to drink high caloric beverages if they can't eat? Of course, that's not there, but they're just trying to get you to think about it. Um, would I tell them the report levels of high glucose? 
And what about food substitution? And what about diarrhea? So, everything in this one is correct, with the exception of uh, BS and boy. So yes, um, we definitely want to notify our healthcare provider um, of high glucose. The reason we want to make sure we substitute things like uh, soup and gelatin because they suggest that the patients still take their insulin or they or their oral medication. And yes, if there's di diarrhea over six hours, yes, that definitely should be reported because that's going to cause um, an acid-base imbalance. I think the next question is the one I might have screwed up. Yes, yeah, so I'm not going to even ask this particular question. Okay. All right, that's it. Any more questions? Recording stopped.